To look at this happy holiday gathering of family and friends, you'd never know that six months from this moment. Well, I'm 39 tomorrow. Huh. Missouri mother of three, Jackie Waller, would be gone. Hey, honey, get this message. Please call me. Nobody knows where you're at. Lured to her fate. When she went inside, it was too late. The prime suspect, a man without remorse. I'm going to stand up in court tomorrow and tell everybody to himself. It's a twisted game of cat and mouse. He was playing with us the whole time. And at the end of it all, I had so much faith in the prosecutors, in the law enforcement. The mystery of what happened to Jackie Waller. There was one tree within that area that was dead. Will be revealed in the most disturbing of ways. You killed my wife. To be that brazen after the fact, to write a book. You just took her mom away? You can't undo that. Growing up, St. Genevieve, Missouri mom, Cheryl Brennicky had trouble connecting with her younger sister, Jackie. I got married when I was 16 and she was 10. So I was busy starting a family, raising kids, and my children was just like irritating younger brothers and sisters to her. So we were never close. But that would all change in adulthood when Jackie, then in her 30s and married to a man named Clay Waller, made an announcement. When she learned she was pregnant, that's whenever we bonded. We finally had something in common. Then we were stuck together at the hip. But it was also then that Cheryl started learning more about the man Jackie was about to make a father. He was a little awkward, but with Jackie, it worked to his advantage. He had a speech impediment. She felt sorry for him. She said, you know, we, I'm an enabler and I'm codependent and I take care of him. I feel sorry for him. Jackie's parents felt something else. I always knew he was kind of a jerk. And dad, what did you think? What did I think about him? Yeah, what did you think I about him? I didn't like him the first minute I seen him. He was not compatible at all with my family. But at least he seemed able to provide for their daughter. At one point, Clay was even a deputy for the Cape Girardeau County Sheriff's Office, though he only held the job for about a year. Did you know him? Yes. He kind of had a little streak about him that I didn't particularly care for. What do you mean by that, a little streak? He had kind of a deceptive uh, demeanor about him. After that, Clay jumped around from job to job. But then Jackie was a manager at a major insurance firm and perfectly able to provide for the family. One that suddenly included triplets. Hi. She just embraced it from the word go. I mean, we would be in the car with three screaming kids and I would really be wanting to jump out and she would just start laughing. She loved being a mother to those triplets. If only they were the only ones who needed mothering. She was taking care of her husband. Oh, absolutely. It was just like having another child. I seriously do not think he changed one diaper. She would seriously get up nine or 10 times a night and still work 40 hours a week. After months, even years of that, Jackie started pulling away, spending more time with her sister's family. Of course, it wasn't just Clay's unwillingness to help that had her seeking distance. She knew that he had a lot of affairs. Did she ever confront Clay? Oh, yeah. And she'd say, he denies everything. everything. But there were some things that Jackie knew to be true. According to her, Clay had become both emotionally and physically abusive. She wanted to divorce. And she told you that? Yes. But she said that she had to do it slowly to get out of it safely. The last Christmas that uh, they were together, uh, he came to the house and I, I knew they'd been having problems. Yes. I said to him, I said, I'm surprised you're here. And he said, I'm hanging on by my fingertips. You love your daddy? It was the day before Jackie's 39th birthday, what was to be her last year of life. Over that year is when things got worse and worse and worse. As Jackie became more determined to leave, Clay became more unhinged. He probably knew 
she was starting to move on her way. And as you know, now it's the most dangerous time. The first 24 hours was the most dangerous and that she had to be very careful and to form a plan. Fearing for her life, Jackie Waller starts keeping a diary on her work computer of all the threats Clay was making towards her and her triplets. 39 tomorrow. Starting from not long before that big Christmas gathering, they read in part, Friday, December 3rd, I told him that I was going to file for divorce. He said that he had a feeling that one of us would not be around to watch our kids grow up. Friday, March 18th, Clay told me that I did not deserve to live. He told me that a divorce would be my death sentence and perhaps the most chilling entry of all. Wednesday, March 23rd, Clay told me that if he couldn't get me, he would kill our kids. He would take them for a weekend fishing trip and then he would personally tell me they drowned so he could see my face. Were you afraid for her? Absolutely. We were sitting here one day and she looked me square in the eye and she said, Cheryl, I know what he is capable of and I just don't want to be dead. But then a blessing in disguise going into that spring, Clay lost another job and the couple lost their house. She was like, oh, this is awesome. You get you a place. I'll get me a place. She just felt like everything was lining up for her break. Are we having fun yet? She took the kids, then five years old, and moved in with Cheryl and her husband, Bob, while Clay moved over an hour away to Jackson, crashing in a house owned by a friend. Both Clay and Jackie moved on in other ways as well, both starting new relationships. She thought he was accepting the separation, that he was going to be accepting the divorce. She said, I just, I think we've really turned a corner. I really do. All that was left to do was finalize the divorce, a process Jackie and Clay agreed to discuss in person just after Memorial Day, June 1st. Jackie's son Maddox had stayed with Clay over the weekend, and the plan was for Jackie to meet her soon-to-be ex at her attorney's office before picking up the boy. Jackie called Cheryl just after the meeting. She said, I just left the attorney's office, and um, I'm pulling up to Clay's, and I'm going to grab Maddox and I'll be on home. The last time Cheryl would ever talk to her sister. She told her sister she was picking up her son Maddox from her estranged husband's house. But three hours after that call, Jackie Waller still wasn't home. And I just got this sick, sick feeling that by this time, it's like 6.30 or 7. And I start blowing up her phone and I'm leaving her messages. But no response. So then she tried calling the man Jackie said she was going to see. Is he responding? Nothing. I finally said, Clay Waller, if I don't hear from my sister in five minutes, I am going straight to the police. And he said, so well, you know, the phone rings. Hey, Cheryl, what's going on? I said, you know exactly what's going on. Where is my sister? You've done something to her. You told him that? Yes. What did he say? Well, I will, uh, if I see her, I'll let you know. I'll tell her to call you. Click. Cheryl wasn't about to wait around for that call. After leaving Jackie's other two triplets with her parents in St. Genevieve, she hops in her car and makes the hour-long drive down to Jackson. I walked in the Jackson PD, and I just said, I know Clay Waller has killed my sister. She had no evidence, but police were listening. Most agencies will tell family members, look, you got to give this 24 hours at least. It had only been a couple hours at this point. Due to the circumstances of they, they had been at the divorce attorneys, something just didn't seem right from the get go with this case. So we started working. In fact, right away, Jackson police sent a sergeant out to question Clay. The interaction is recorded. When was the last time you saw her? I was with her all day. Were you? Yeah. Clay tells the officer Jackie met him at a drugstore sometime after 11 a.m., then had lunch. After that, they split up until 3 when they met back up at their attorney's office. Okay. Good conversation. She didn't act like she was upset or anything? 
No. He says after the appointment, Jackie came over not to pick up her son, who Clay says is actually staying with his girlfriend in Illinois, but because she just wanted to discuss the divorce. The last time you actually saw her here. Did you? A nap together. I don't know. And then she. Then we got. Kind of got. We got in an argument over this makeup. Okay. Okay. She took off walking. She just walked off. Yeah. Did you go try to look for her in your car then? Yeah, I went down the hill. I didn't see her, and I went. I went and got a soda to cool off. He says when he got back to his house sometime after six, her car was gone. Should I keep trying to call? I mean it. Probably. The story sounds suspicious, and just hours later, authorities begin assembling a team of seasoned investigators known as the Major Case Squad. Well, the Major Case Squad consists of like seven different departments, and it was developed with the goal of taking the elite detectives, crime scene people from each agency, and putting them together. It's the best of the best. It is. And almost immediately, the team finds one very big clue. Jackie's car abandoned on this interstate, one tire flat as though it had been blown out. Maybe she flagged down the wrong person for help. I mean, it, it was possible that someone could have kidnapped her from the side of the road. But that scenario became a lot less likely when investigators took a closer look at the flat tire. We had somebody come in from Missouri State Highway Patrol who could tell us that the rim was not in any way damaged. So she hadn't driven on a flat tire. It had clearly been punctured while stationary roadside. The whole scene was staged. When was your first contact with Clay? Before we started the search, he said, hang on, I want to call my attorney. And immediately after he got off the phone, he made a comment that we couldn't search the car or his house. Not even 24 hours after Jackie disappeared, Clay Waller had lawyered up. So detectives quickly apply for warrants to search Jackie's car, Clay's truck, and the house where he was staying. We had one later that afternoon. Lieutenant Jeff Bonham and Agent Brian Ritter of the FBI were there during the subsequent searches. What did you find? Uh, well, we happened to be standing by the car and Agent Ritter looks over and says, hey, that's, that looks like a blood spot on the back of her car. And when investigators search Clay's truck, more blood smeared on the inside of the driver's side door. Both samples are sent to the lab, and unbelievably, when the results come back... It turns out to be fish blood. That's right, fish blood. It's big head carp, specifically. Clay had intentionally put on the door of his truck. And just how does she know that? He did that in fish blood. He recorded himself with his cell phone doing this, uh, saying that he had just put that fish blood there Basically, it's a test for law enforcement. I want to see if they would be shady or not. But then, that wasn't the only DNA police found. Back at Clay's house, team members arrived to find the hallway carpet missing. And that's not all. We located what we believe to be uh, blood on the walls in the hallway. Basically, everywhere you see a tag. Something that happened in that hallway. There was a violent confrontation, absolutely. But investigators still had to determine where the blood came from, what happened to that missing carpet, and of course, what happened to Jackie. Then... I'm looking around in the basement and I see this, this crawl space, and there appears to be like a disturbed pathway where the dust and dirt is, and I was like, hey, we got to look in this crawl space. Four days after mother of triplets, Jackie Waller disappeared, her estranged husband, Clay, left her this voicemail. Hey, honey. It's Sunday afternoon, getting missing since Wednesday. Please, if you get this message, please call me. I don't know where you're at. I miss you so terribly. Please call. But just one day after that, investigators find traces of blood in Clay's hallway, the carpet torn up, and a recently used crawl space in the basement. Did you think Jackie could have been under there? That was a good possibility, yes. This recreation, recorded by the Major Case Squad, shows how FBI agent Brian Ritter crawled through the narrow space beneath the floorboards of that blood-stained hallway. He crawls back up and says, you guys ain't gonna believe it. He goes, the carpet runner and the padding's cut up and it's all back here, you know, in this crawl space. So he didn't find a body, but he found the carpet. That's correct. Which was a huge piece of this investigation. Yes. 
huge because several of those pieces were soaked with blood. Did the blood come back to be Jackie? Yes, it did. Conclusion? I think we all had a very strong suspicion that she was, she was dead. But without a body, there still wasn't enough to prove anything. So investigators began searching for clues by reconstructing the last day Jackie was seen alive. It starts in this drugstore, where around 11 o'clock that day, Jackie is seen walking up to meet Clay. Approximately two hours later, Jackie is caught on this ATM surveillance video. That's the last time that we know that she was alive. But it's not the last we see of Clay. Hours after that, he spotted inside this toy store, wearing a completely different outfit than the one in that drugstore. Uh, Clay had pulled up into the parking lot to meet his girlfriend who had Maddox. That's Clay's truck outside with a trash can in the back. What you can't see is the small boat he's towing. But you can definitely see it here in a video from later that night. We found the car wash video where he was washing the boat. You could tell that he was looking to see if there was something on the boat like blood. And when police released images of the boat to the public? We had a young man, a young woman that was out by the Mississippi River, saw a small boat of that description across the river. Floating next to a remote sandbar known as Devil's Island. So we searched that island multiple times. But investigators could find no signs of Jackie. Still, they felt Clay knew way more than what he was saying. So days after Jackie disappeared, Agent Ritter convinces him to come in for a formal interview. Though there was no audio recorded, Clay tells Ritter that the blood in the hallway, that was, quote, the result of an accident in the kitchen, which according to Clay was not a big deal. The carpet, the blood, was it enough at the time, did you believe, to move forward with a murder case against him? I think we all knew we were on the right track, but we knew we needed more without a body to, to feel comfortable going forward. And so over the next several weeks, investigators keep a very close eye on Clay. Early on in the investigation, we put a tracker on his truck at that point. Unfortunately, all it revealed was that Clay, a former sheriff's deputy himself, knew the tracker was there. I mean, there was times where he would go and uh, sit for a while in a vacant lot. So it would cause us to get search teams to go to that area and start searching. He was sending you on a cat and mouse chase. He was. He was playing with us the whole time. Soon, pictures of Jackie were everywhere. And with the entire community focused on the case, Clay Waller became increasingly frantic. What's Clay doing during this time? He's laughing it all off. He thinks it's funny. He would come by and honk the horn, say, you guys ain't going to find nothing, bunch of fools and all that stuff. I had search crews from all over the country here, but Clay would drive by them. He would give them a finger gesture and uh, just laugh. But all that brazenness was about to backfire. By that time, the court had already awarded custody of Jackie's triplets to her sister, Cheryl. And apparently, Clay had some strong opinions about that, posting a comment online that read in part, quote, you are dead, I promise, if those kids get hurt. I will get you five, 10, 25 years from now. You have it coming. He just couldn't help himself. He had to keep taunting people. I saw the post come in across topics, and I called Agent Ritter in to look at it. I knew at that point when Agent Ritter saw it that he had committed a federal crime. Finally, four months after Jackie disappeared, Clay Waller was under arrest. Okay, good luck to you. Thank you. Not for her murder, but on a federal charge for threatening her sister's life. I need more love for you. But would the suspect finally come clean? From the first few hours Jackie Waller went missing, police started looking at her estranged husband, Clay Waller. But still, the suspected killer ran free. Were you in fear of your own safety? Was I afraid of Clay? <laughs> no, I was wishing to God he would come up here. Nearly five months after Jackie disappeared, Clay was arrested on a federal charge for threatening her sister online. And that's not all, according to prosecutor Angel Woodruff. In a situation like this where you have a major crime, if it gets to the point where your primary suspect appears to be a danger to the community, then we start looking really hard at anything we can charge him with. 
And at the same time Clay is busted for making those threats, investigators also dig up allegations of stealing over $50,000 from a previous job and harassing a former friend. Before Clay is taken away, detectives try to learn more about Jackie's disappearance. Hey, Jackie. As good as I can be. As he's done since the beginning, Clay denies his involvement, claiming he's the real victim here. And Jack's around. And if, 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 if you guys know so much, figure it out. I don't know what to tell you. I had nothing to do with nothing. That's just In fact, he has his own theories pointing the finger for whatever happened to his wife at a former associate named Gary. He killed my wife. He killed her. And he and he knows he knows I can prove it eventually. The problem with that is police have already disproven it. His stories have all run out and are alibi. The world's crumbling around you. You're by your own needs. At the end of it all, Clay stands firm that he did not kill his wife, even claiming to have proof that will exonerate him. I don't know where she's at. <laughs> Clay eventually pleads guilty to the federal charge of threatening Jackie's sister and is sentenced to five years behind bars. At the same time, prosecutors work to make sure he will also face justice for Jackie. We couldn't even prove that she was dead. So we scraped together every single bit of circumstantial evidence that we could until we got to the point where, okay, we're ready. The blood in his house, the surveillance videos, the fact that Clay actively tried to hinder the investigation. This blood. And there was so much more. After nearly two years of turning over every rock, prosecutors finally felt comfortable enough to prove their case. He was charged with murder in the first degree and tampering with physical evidence. But despite Woodruff's best efforts, without a body, getting a conviction was no guarantee. There's no such thing as a slam dunk case. Plus, even though Jackie's family wanted Clay to face the stiffest punishment possible, there was something else they wanted more. Stan and Ruby Rawson indicated that the most important thing to them was to get Jackie back. So when Clay's attorneys approached prosecutors to make a deal. We told them, we will accept a plea because we want to find her. You want Jackie home? We want her home. The deal was Clay Waller would plead guilty to second degree murder and accept a sentence of 20 years in exchange for revealing what he did with Jackie. It came right down until the time when he was going to go on trial then he realized that he was pretty well cooked. When the time came, Clay would lead investigators right back to a place they'd searched before, a remote sandbar on the Illinois side of the Mississippi River, known as Devil's Island. Knowing Clay and how we'd dealt with him for two years, we weren't 100% sure that he was telling us the truth, so we were still pessimistic about being able to locate her. And when the team got to the location, Clay only reinforced those fears. He couldn't pinpoint where she was at. <clears throat> it was a large area. He says, well, she's here somewhere. Then, a clue in one of the gruesome details of Clay's crime. One key thing he had told us was he had put a bag of fertilizer on her body when he buried her. One of the detectives indicated if you have too much fertilizer, it kills the roots of a tree. And that's when they see it. One of my detectives, an agent Ritter, was studying the area and they saw three trees and one of the trees was completely dead. And there, buried under that tree, the end of one very long road. Was Jackie dug up by hand out there? Yes, I did it myself. We started to dig down and, and we first found uh, her knee. Uh, we could feel the skeletal remains with the blue jeans. And the next day we recovered her and uh, it was the first step of, for her trip home. Not the homecoming anyone really wanted, but at least one part of the mystery was solved. And then it hit us that we now we had to tell the kids, that we had to tell them that their mommy was dead and that their dad did it. And what was their reaction? We just all cried together. And then we just assured them that we would love them and take care of them and that we would do our best to raise them. 
That's Cheryl and her husband Bob sitting in silence with the triplets as their mother is finally laid to rest. I leave you now for a little while for a home that awaits us all. Her funeral was on the day of our 50th wedding anniversary. But there was still another part of Clay's plea agreement left to fulfill. As part of his deal to get just 20 years for murdering his wife, Clay would have to confess on camera to every brutal detail of his crime. How exactly was Jackie murdered? Well... Across Mead of Driftwood stands where Jackie Waller was finally found, discovered only after her husband of nearly 18 years admitted to putting her there. But leading investigators to the body was only half of Clay's deal. In exchange for pleading guilty to second degree murder, he also had to give a full videotape confession of his crime. The president of the room is Brian Ritter, prosecuting attorney Andrew Woodruff, and Clay Waller. I don't 39 tomorrow. <laughs> Clay says the wheels were really set in motion the year before Jackie died when she first started talking about splitting up. She said, I think I'm going to take. Our kids, and I, I was very calm, and I said, I, I looked at her and I said, you take those kids from me, Jackie, I'm going to kill you. In other words, says Clay, she was warned. I turned. I was not concerned for her safety anymore. And then she, she came in about May 3rd, and she said, I want to go and get abortion. I said, okay. I knew he was going to die as soon as you did it. What day did you dig the hole that you buried her in? The day before. But here's where investigators really start to question the confession. Based on statements from Jackie's loved ones, prosecutors have always believed that after meeting with their divorce attorney the next day, Clay lured Jackie back to his place by saying he had their son, Maddox. But just listen to what Clay says really got Jackie to his house that day. She was like, you want to have one last bang before we make this final? I'm like, yeah, it's going to be a bang, all right. Well, yeah. She what said, do you mean one last bang? To, 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 to go have sex. It was a stunning claim, and interrogators weren't buying it. Nor did they believe what Clay said next, that after going back to his place for sex, they ended up in the kitchen, where it all started by accident. Did I hear in the, in the, on her nose, when, on my head? When he claims that Jackie was getting into the refrigerator and he was getting something out of the refrigerator at the same time and raised his head up and then hit her nose with his head and that caused her nose to bleed. She took off running and she tripped and she, she tripped in here. In the hallway where investigators found all that blood, Clay says that's also where Jackie, probably mad about the innocent accident, started provoking him. She makes a statement. She said, I wonder how much time you would give the kids if, you, if everybody knew you just beat me up. I'm like, beat you up. I hit her backhand into the side of her neck. That was the first thing I did. You backhanded her across her neck? Yeah. She stayed standing? No. She went straight to the ground. It was, he says, the point of no return. She's basically like, you, 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 you or something like that. And I, I stood over and I punched her right in, right in the nose. That's what she said. You ain't ever gonna see these kids. So I just took my, I just took my forearm, I just pressed into her neck and until she stopped moving. Did she ever move again? Nope, she died right there. To hear Clay tell it, the attack was almost spur of the moment. A crime of passion brought on by an accident in the kitchen and Jackie's threats. I wasn't intentionally pre-planned to kill my wife that day. That wasn't the case at all. The problem with that claim? Clay's own statements from just moments before. So digging the hole the day before was not premeditation? Well... I guess you could see it that way. And that still wasn't the only thing that didn't add up. How many times did you punch her? Once. Just once? In once. the nose? Yeah. 
But Jackie's autopsy told a different story, revealing multiple fractures to her face and skull consistent with blunt force trauma. I don't know what to tell you, because I punched it one time, and then I put my hand on it. That's what happened. We knew information that would let us know if he was telling the truth, and he lied. But one thing she does believe is Clay's claim that after he killed Jackie, he put her body in a trash can, loaded it into the back of his truck, then drove to meet his girlfriend and five-year-old son at the toy store. He was at the Toys R Us with Jackie's body in the back of his truck and his son right there. Yes. Clay says after that, he took Jackie across the river to Devil's Island, where after dumping her into the pre-dug grave, he says a few final words. I told her I just, all I was, all I was at one, was my family, or something along those lines. That's what I told her. In the end, Clay's confession was hard for many to accept. After turning his three children into orphans, lying his way through the confession, and even blaming the victim, because of his plea deal, Clay would still only serve a maximum of 20 years. What do you think about the 20-year sentence? Well, obviously, it's too light uh, for what he did, but I stand behind the family. And as it turns out, prosecutors still had one more trick up their sleeves. It was a new twist in the investigation, for sure. Clay Waller has admitted to murdering the mother of his three children, but investigators still aren't convinced they've heard the whole truth, and they certainly haven't heard much regret. When he tried to blame it on Jackie, it was her fault. It was typical Clay Waller. Thought nothing of anyone except himself. And if there's any doubt about that, just listen to this jailhouse phone call between Clay and one of his relatives, recorded just before his sentencing. You need to be apologetic and remorseful. I'm not. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand up in court tomorrow and tell about to himself. Why should I care what they're going through if they don't care what I'm going through? You understand? I'm no, not. I don't. You're not the victim here, Clay. This happened two years ago. I just want to move on. I'm sorry, I'm going to jail. That's it. Unfortunately, Clay didn't have to show remorse. As part of his deal and for pleading guilty to second degree murder, he can't be sentenced to more than 20 years. When I walk out them doors, they can't do nothing more to me. I mean, I don't think they can, can they? Turns out they could. During his confession, Clay let slip that he dug his wife's grave in Illinois the night before the murder, then came back to Missouri to take her life. As luck would have it, that was a violation of the rarely used Interstate Domestic Violence Act. It was Clay's travel across state lines with the intent to commit domestic violence, which resulted in a federal charge being filed later. His punishment for that crime? a much heftier 35 years in federal prison. And that sentence won't even begin until after he serves out the 20 years for murder. He shot himself in the foot over and over and over because he thinks he's the smartest person in the room, but he is absolutely not. Before Clay is taken away to serve out his time, he's forced to stand up in court and listen to Jackie's loved ones give victim impact statements, the most dramatic testimony coming from his own son. Maddox, he was determined. He, his voice was going to be heard. I wish you were never my dad, you big fat jerk. I never want to see you again for my entire life. We don't like you anymore. This is the last time you'll hear of me. Okay? Bye. Clay had no reaction to this? He did not. Think it impacted him at all? No. In fact, there is one final chapter to the deranged story written by Clay himself. We learned that Clay had written a book detailing the murder of his wife and his actions after. What was the book's title? He titled the book, If You Take My Kids, I'll Kill You. One last slap in the face to the family he tore apart. 
I think it just goes to show you that Clay Waller's depravity knows no bounds. But while Jackie's family remains forever fractured by what Clay has done, they are far from broken. The kids he orphaned have now been officially adopted by Jackie's sister, Cheryl, and her husband, Bob. They are such good kids. And I would say the biggest positive comment that I can ever hear, and I hear it pretty regularly, is the new people that meet them say they would have never known that these children had been through so much. And I can testify to that fact, having had the opportunity to sit down with them myself. That's a good picture. Oh my goodness. You all look like your mom in such different ways. What do you want people to know about your mom? I um, want people to know that she was nice, funny, caring. Yeah, she was really nice and caring and she just loved everyone. The children, now 12, were just five when it all happened, but they still have vivid memories from that time, Maddox in particular. Do you remember giving your victim impact statement? Yes. Why was that important to you? I just wanted to help make a difference inside the case. Like, I already knew what happened and everything. I'm like, and I thought I should just do this message just so he knows, like, I don't care for him anymore. And just like, that he gets that he has ruined the bond between us and him and that he, he's never gonna have that back. Like, he just took, took our mom away and that, so I was just trying to show him that you can't undo that. But while the triplets are angry with their dad and they miss their mom, they are now being raised in a house full of love. Their mother's memory kept alive by the very woman who kick-started the investigation into her death, Jackie's sister, Cheryl. We just love them so much. They never have to doubt that. Did a good job, Aunt Cheryl. Thank you.